Mine went up at uh, Fort at, uh, Mount Soledad. So there's definitely a Navy tradition. Uh, granddad was World War I Navy. Uh, other granddad was a single in World War II, submarine sailor. But I did have an uncle who was an Air Force guy. So, Navy, if you lived here in the 60s, as a kid, you would not even think about going to the Navy. Coast Guard, you couldn't get into if you were drowning, you couldn't get into the Coast Guard. Uh, Marines, you get shot at in the Marines, so that was off my list. And then there was the Army, you get shot in the Army, too. So, well, I think I'll try this Air Force thing. So I went to the recruiter, took the test, the four part uh, scoring, and depending on how you scored, it guaranteed you one of four uh, classifications. Um, I picked electronics just because I did, and off I went to Latin Air Force Base in 1968. Living in the good old World War II wood barracks that some of you probably lived in, and they were all over the world, but still are all over the world. Up to the Ely uh, radar, which I don't know if I guess is still there. 
We had C-band tracking radars, X-band tracking radars, Cynthioidalite precision cameras, precision bombing range, and the rocket slide, which had just closed when I got there. Here's the runway stand. It's the main runway, 15,000 feet. It's uh, 300 feet wide. The secondary is 12,000 feet, 200 feet wide. Uh, there's a third runway, it's 800 feet. Uh, plus, if you run off the end, there's another 10,000 feet of lake bed. Uh, and then on the lake bed, every year they would mark out the 39,000 foot lake bed runway and then the 22,000 foot runway. I will tell you, when everybody got called up to go do the annual runway fog walk, to walk a 15,000 foot by 300 foot runway sucks. <laughs> Especially when there's not that many GIs on the base. The base was 90% run by civilians. Um, there were three GIs in the whole place where I uh, originally went to work at the telemetry station. Uh, but makes it so good for testing is the lake bed. This lake bed is like a pool table in the summertime. It's dry, it's hard. Um, it's, uh, it's an amazing, amazing place because the surface is so hard. Um, in the winter, it can look like this. It'll actually get uh, water. It could have three, four inches of water on the lake in the wintertime. When the lake is wet, they had this guy who'd been there since the 40s, Mr. Lake Bed. You did not look at the lake bed until he said it was okay. You didn't touch it, drive on it, think about it, uh, because they didn't want to run it out uh, with, in the mud when the mud was still soft. So he decided it was okay to start using the lake bed again. Uh, the 2508 complex for you pilots. I'm sure you've blown up this area, you've seen it on your charts, which is the restricted area for Edwards. Uh, inside there, there are several other smaller restricted areas for Edwards itself, the bombing range, China Lake, but 2508 is the, uh, the major restricted area, it is controlled by um, Edwards. So here's this handsome young fella at his first job at Edwards, and I was working at the telemetry station. We had five, I guess, different control rooms at the telemetry station for, uh, for flight tests. Most of the work I did was with civilian engineers um, from General Dynamics and uh, McDonnell Douglas would come in and uh, we'd provide them their real time, this is the real time track uh, our data station. We also had FPS 16 tracking radars, C band radars. There were, there were two of them there, one megawatt. They'll fry birds out of the sky. Um, and each one has a 80 inch focal length TV camera. Um, you notice I didn't say 80 millimeters, it's an 80 inch lens. You can really see out uh, with these things. We also had a Nike Hercules where they take a a Nike Hercules X-band radar and turn it into a data gathering radar. Really, really good tracking radar, skin tracker. Um, it's only 500,000 watts, but it was uh, it still worked really well. The C-band radars were would track a transponder, uh, which would increase their range and, and also uh, made the data more accurate with the transponder tech tracking. So here's the first project I was assigned to, F-111A, which was a horrible airplane. Um, it should have been F-111H for horrible. 1968, we were still doing spin tests on F-111. And they were already starting to deploy F-111s out to the, uh, to the rest of the world. Um, this airplane would get the most god-awful, horrible flat spins you ever saw in your entire life. It was, uh, the airplane was flown by a pilot from General Dynamics, their uh, test pilot. Um, several occasions I told him to eject and he didn't. And actually ended up recovering it from flying it away. You'll see the thing sticking out of the tail, it's a big giant parachute container. So if the airplane got into a spin and they finally couldn't get out of it, they deployed the parachute, dropped the nose of the airplane and start getting the air over the control surfaces and the theory was you could fly it away. Also, you can restart the engine because 
these flat spins are so bad, the engines would typically flame out with no air through them. Um, never did see it crash. They finally decided enough was enough already and that there was no good way to get it out of a flat spin, I think. And then we had the ejection capsule for the F-111A. Um, 111 did not have ejection seats. The whole living room was ejected. Uh, which on the face of it sounded like a really good idea. And it was a pretty comfortable airplane to fly in because you sat side by side instead of front and back. One of the 111s left one day and were not tracking it. They were just off. I don't even know what they were doing, but they didn't come back. And we started looking for them in there. The uh, Star Sky are looking for them. They found the airplane in a big pile of rubble up in the uh, Sierra someplace. And there was a capsule not that far away sitting on the ground and both the crew were dead. They discovered after doing a bunch of tests, well, first they grounded every F-111 that there was, which happened about every three weeks. Grounded them all, started testing, they discovered that 50% of the capsules, the parachute board went number, which is sort of interesting on a system that's supposed to be 99% effective. And they discovered that of the 50% that did open, 50% of those were the parachute board when it came out of the door. So this started a very long process of re-engineering and re-manufacturing on the uh, F-111 and sort of ended our spin project. We had uh, F-4Es, which is where Ron and Ron knows about F-4Es. Um, there was a project called Tizio, which was a side-looking target, targeting radar. Did you have Tizio, right? Um, I don't know if it ever even got deployed. We had the rows of trucks and tanks and personnel carriers out in the desert. We would vector them up and down these rows of tanks and trucks. And then, of course, compare that picture data that they provided with uh, known data. Um, pilots didn't like it because you got to fly down the track for maybe two or three minutes, and then you had to turn around and come back to the track and fly down the track another two or three minutes, and turn around and come back again for about two hours. Crappy mission for the pilot. And then came the C5. We prepared for the C5 for a year. Because, number one, there was never an airplane that big. Uh, they built a hangar that could drive it inside and close the door. Um, they constructed a hydrant system for fueling because it took seven fuel trucks to fill the thing. So they ran pipe down the hill from the fuel dump down onto the apron and uh, built it. <coughs> Hydro system to fuel the C5. Um, all new uh, instrumentation for the C5, so digital instrumentation, where a lot of our instrumentation was all uh, analog. And this picture is the number one airplane. You can see the probe sticking out in front of it. It was not a complete airplane. The, the nose did not open, but the tail did. It's totally empty inside, other than the flight deck. Um, and then there were racks and racks of water tanks installed so that we could fill these water tanks so we could change the CG and loading of the airplane by adding uh, water to these water tanks. This to me is one of the, the funniest the pictures from the C5. Look at the difference. Refueling off of 135. Good heavens. I'm not so sure that they probably didn't burn as much fuel as they took in the amount of time they were connected to the 135. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it was always pretty funny watching the thing in this picture. But C5 could refuel. And, uh, the uh, number two C5 showed up. And the number two C5, the project was 1,000 hours of flight time as soon as possible. Because nobody had any idea what the maintenance was going to be on these big new airplanes. Nobody had ever built an airplane this big, parts this big. They really didn't know. The engineers, are there any engineers here? I have to apologize. We called the engineers the what ifs. Because they walked in the hangar, the first words out of their mouth was usually, what if we tried this? Um, but nobody knew. So the idea was this airplane had several hundred data points uh, installed, and they would go up and fly 15, 16 hours, just boring holes in the sky, recording data, and come back and post flight the data for maybe two or three days. The engineers would go and stuff. You go, oh, look at this. This thing right here has got a little vibration in about 300 hours, so we probably ought to change it out at 250 hours. And that 
that's truthfully how they de developed the initial maintenance schedules on a lot of parts on the airplane, which of course were modified over time and everything else, but that was the initial, initial uh, maintenance schedule. Soft field operations, which is sort of an interesting project. So we're testing all sorts of different things with the C5 and loading and they would fly anywhere. They flew to, they flew to Spokane via Tennessee one day because somewhere in Tennessee was having an air show and actually gave them somewhere to go instead of just boring holes in the sky for 16 hours. So they went up to a lake up north of Edwards. I'm trying to remember the name of the dry lake. I don't know. All right, the second. They didn't use the uh, Edwards Lake for soft field testing. They want to see how uh, how soft the field would be when you tow in C5. And they took a bunch of water trucks and they landed the airplane and the engineers out there they're a little measuring. They measured the tire indentations in the mud for the lake. They wet it down, they measured again, they landed again, they measured, they landed and then they kept getting wetter and wetter. And, and of course the tire tracks were getting deeper and deeper. And, C5, you can decrease the tire pressure just like the C-130 to, to uh, for soft field landings. So finally they said, okay, this is it. Here's the number, this is as soft as it can be. And they had this uh, number, which I don't even recall what the number was, but it was a softness number was that. So then the one of the what-ifs said, well, we should now see how short it will stop with the soft field. Ooh, that sounds like a Took off, came around, put it down with full reverse thrust. The engines on a C5 are really big, and you have a lot of thrust, obviously. And they picked up nice big chunks of mud. And we're not talking about this kind of chunks of mud, we're talking like this kind of chunks of mud. Threw it up in front of the intakes and took out two of the engines. So now here sits this airplane. I don't know, 60, 70 miles from the base. Two bad engines on a mucky lake bed. And now they're going, like the Three Stooges, now what do we do? Now started a huge convoy of engine stands and mechanics and all the equipment needed to change out engines. They uh, called the commanding officer in Barstow and the Marines came out and laid down a bunch of Marston mat for them so they could actually work in the mud. And about two and a half weeks later, they finally got their plane out. The whole time, of course, the commanding officer of the C-5 test project was having a power because his airplane was stuck out in the mud. I worked at FB-111 nuclear weapons certification. That was a very odd project. We took a off-the-line FB, and FB-111, which was designed for SAC, as a bomber, it was a modification of the normal FB-11A, was a really good airplane. And we did uh, every weapon, every aircraft that carries nuclear weapons has to go through this certification process. So the guys from Sandia showed up with their mock-up weapons, uh, with telemetry transmitters in them, and uh, the way you turned on the telemetry was that you armed the weapon, which was a little disconcerting. As you're going down the checklist and you're turning on the nuclear consent switch, even though you know it's really not, it still makes you pucker a little bit. And they were really interested in vibration. And of course, we never knew what they were worried about or what and how much, um, because that wasn't our problem, that was their problem. It was one of the reasons I started doing this. Is one of my kids one day said, so what'd you do in the Air Force, Dad? And I said, well, I did lots of stuff. Well, what kind of stuff? Well, I mean, a lot of stuff. And of course, those of you that, that were in the military, you know that when you get out, they tell you, you can't say anything about this, 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 and this, and this, and this, and whatever they want you to say anything that you have clearances for, whatever. But they never tell you when you can't say anything. So I said, well, I don't know. So I started this thing and looking at pictures. And this was an interesting project. F-11, or F-4 spins. The F-4 guys were having issues in Vietnam with flat spins. So the Navy, and the Air Force, and McDonnell Douglas had a joint project to develop spin recovery techniques. And the airplane was flown by Major Jerry Gentry, who was the best pilot I ever flew with, and I flew with a lot of pilots. Um, Gentry was amazing. He was one of these guys that he couldn't tell you how he did what he did, but he just did it. Um, so we had video cameras in the airplane, we had telemetry on the airplane. We 
wired the uh, intercom to the telemetry so he could talk to us without having to key the, the uh, mic switch. And it was pretty much decided that it was either going to uh, there you can see the spin shoot tears off the back of the airplane. Tears off the back of the airplane? Yeah, we deployed the spin shoot and just ripped off the back. And you can see, that, you know, a lot of people think spins are like in the movies, and they're not. Very slow, very deliberate. And that was the end of the project. Uh, Major Gentry then spent the next, I think, six months touring F-4 bases all over the world, lecturing on F-4 spin recoveries with all the videos and all the information that we've gotten from this, from this research. Amazing pilot. After this crash, we were putting all the telemetry away and the radar data away. <clears throat> By this time, I was working in the Mission Control Center. We always classified anything that we had as soon as there was a crash. And it wasn't because it was secret necessarily, it was because that protected the data from being inadvertently tampered, destroyed, because it would be locked up. So we're locking up the data, we your helicopter out in the parking lot. And Jeffrey comes running in the door and he goes, pretty cool crash, guys, how was that? Show, show me the video, I want to see the tapes. Which, of course, we weren't supposed to show them the tapes, we were supposed to be locked them in the safe, but of course we did show them the tapes. But, uh, Jeffrey was an amazing pilot. We did FB-111 long-range navigation system testing. Um, this airplane, and all of you remember when we tried to kill Gaddafi and we missed him. Airplane that we just missed him with. Killed his mother, right? And this is the same system that we just missed him with. Uh, it was an inertial platform. They took off and they flew 15 hours and they came back with deliver weapons on the bomb range in Edwards. Uh, at 1,000 feet at Bach 1.4. It worked really good usually, except when it didn't. One afternoon we had two pilots that were SAC pilots. They weren't test pilots from Edwards, they were SAC guys. And they came in and their nav system crapped out in about 14 hours. And they were tired after flying for 14 hours. And they came in and they called me on the radio and said, can we just go ahead and manually put the weapons on the bomb range? I said, sure. So we would calculate the drop point and put it up. We used the XY plotters of four foot square. And I'm monitoring and they're reading me the you know, where they think they are, and I'm now counting down. We always use the same language when we drop things on the bomb range. Always, always, always the same words, and everybody that flew at Edwards knew the same words, and we briefed anybody that was not used to flying there on the words. So I'm, uh, we also, we also wired a tone generator on the radio for the people that, and we use that as a data mark. So when they deploy the weapons, it would go beep, and the cameras and the radars and the telemetry and everybody had a time hack now that they could sync the data with. So I give them the 60 seconds to release, I give them the 30 seconds to release, 15 seconds to release, 10 seconds to release, beep! Oh, this is not good. They grab my calipers and they go like this, and the weapons should have hit, hit in the middle of Highway 395. The good part is they were iron bombs, there was no explosive in them. The bad part is they were going to land in the middle of 395. So I grabbed my boss and I said, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The good part is they were just a skosh late on the button. And they landed about 150 feet inside the gate, the fence. So if you drive up Highway 395 and Highway 58, everything in that corner to the south and the west is the end of the bomb range. So they were approaching from Barstow, basically. Yeah, what we call the supersonic quarter. All the supersonic work was done across the desert from around Marston and then over the range. And uh, the bombs hit inside the fence. Um, now, of course, ends up a big debrief, and I'm standing there in my... See, at that time, I probably had four strikes. And a bunch of flag officers, a bunch of officers, including the base general, and we're talking, and so what happened? And my boss, who was the GS-13, I think, 
said, well, you know, this is what happened. Can we hear the tape? Well, no, he said, so what happened to this young officer? Captain Pilot said, well, you know, we heard the release and we wiggled the weapons. Okay, that's good. And then uh, the general says to my boss, can we play the tape? And he said, well, sure. And I am clear as can be. And the general looked at these two young men and said, my office, 30 minutes. And we understood later that he sent them back to, I think they're from Korea, Nebraska, SAC base in Korea, Nebraska. Sent them back on the bus and they ferried another aircraft out to Edwards to take the airplane. So, eight nine heat seekers. Eight nine heat seekers were having a problem with near misses. They, uh, it was a really good missile that they were having trouble with heat with near misses. So one of the what ifs said, well, what if we put a proximity switch in there? So that if it was a near miss, it would still go off. And we went, that sounds like a cool idea. So the guys from, I want to say Hughes, Dude, Hughes are raising I forget who built this one. They show up with this missile, and it's got a proximity fuse. They took the warhead out and put a telemetry pack in there so that we could monitor the data from the, from the missile. Captain flew it, everything was good. The airplane went up to Hill Air Force Base to fly against the fire beam. They roll in on the fire beam, lock up on the fire beam, fire the missile. Look at it, the data, you see the launch tone, and immediately after is the detonation tone in the warhead. Well, sort of odd. Well, the what ifs had forgotten that the heat seeker would see the nose of the launching airplane. <laughs> so if it would have been a live warhead, it would have taken the nose of the F4 off. Um, but they were making big money, and these were very highly skilled engineers, which. So they put the proximity switch in there, and then it worked really good. This is another what if project, which is still in use today. Um, the gunship. C-130 gunship had a 30 millimeter cannon, it had a 40 millimeter Gulf War um, cannon in it. And one of the what ifs said, what if we put a 105 howitzer in there? <laughs> I went, ooh, that sounds like a cool idea. So they rigged it up and we fired it on the range and it is very cool. And the 105 gunships today still have the 105. Uh, which has to be just a scary as hell weapon if you're on the ground having somebody shoot one of five rounds down at you. It was bad enough with the uh, miniguns. <coughs> A7, and you say, here's the A7, and you see this little Cessna above it, and you wonder what the heck's the Cessna got to do with that A7. Um, we had a gunnery range, and we were doing gun testing with the A7. And there was a wood tower where uh, the control beam radio. So I'm in the tower like this, and the cart, or not cart, or canvas, targets like this. And they would come in and fire and go around, and usually, most times we'd have two airplanes doing this. So a controller would control them into fire, they'd fire, they'd pull out and go around. So I clear the A7 into fire, and he comes in, and he's about, and you see him go off like this. And I ask him on the radio, what's, what's, uh, you have a problem? He says, look down range, and here's a guy in a Cessna, I don't know, 150, 172, whatever it was, about 300 feet off the deck, right across the gunnery. <laughs> um, if the A7 would have hit him, it would have been pieces of aluminum about this big. Um, I'm sure it scared the crap out of him when the A7 pulled up next to him to get his tail number so he could call the FAA. Uh, never heard what happened to the guy, and never knew what the heck he was doing in there in the first place. This happened not real often, but often enough. These guys would end up in a restricted area, and then, of course, this guy had to violate two restricted areas to get to where he was. Um, and he just thought it was perfectly fine. Barriers. Most people don't know that a lot of Air Force bases have a barrier, have a cape at the end of the runway. Um, Air Force F-4s have tailbacks. This is a picture of an F-111 engaging in cable with no landing gear. Uh, and it was pretty amazing because the airplanes had some damage, but the crew walked away unscathed um, from engaging the wire. It's kind of hard to see this picture. And of course, just like an aircraft carrier. Uh, 
Uh, we had a couple of different systems we were testing. One had big drums of glycol that were in pits in the ground that didn't work that great because they went over speed and then the glycol would expand and boil them and blow the bolts off and blow the lids off these big bins and hot, throw hot glycol all over the place. The earlier ones had like B-52 brakes and you could adjust the brakes for whatever weight of airplane uh, you were expecting. I don't know if they have some oil barriers at Air Force bases or not. I don't know if our new spy airplanes have those. It would make any difference. It did for a long time. And we did lots of testing on the, uh, on the barriers. On November 27, 1970, a charter DC-8 en route to Vietnam runs off the head of uh, Anchorage's new 10,000 foot runway, carrying troops to Vietnam. There were 48 killed and, and many, many injured. Uh, Senior Master Sergeant Ronald Wakinson, who was my uncle, who was on his way for a second deployment to Vietnam, uh, crawled off the airplane and then turned around and crawled back in and made several trips back and forth on the airplane, pulling out injured troops. <coughs> and he was awarded the Airman's Medal, which is the highest award for non-combat so now there was a big, big uh, initiative that, okay, this could have happened at any civilian airport, so we need to be able to come up with a system to fix that. So here was this thing here. There's a French company designed, and it was the vertical lines are nylon cable or webbing about that wide, cable on the ground, cable overhead, and the whole thing folded down into the runway. The idea was the pilot would mash a button in the cockpit if it was point of no return, and this whole thing would like this. It was amazing to watch this thing erect itself. Um, and then the airplane would, the nose would go through the straps and we would stop the airplane with these, stra these straps along the leading edge of the wings. So they said, well, we should test this. And uh, the guys in the uh, FAA kind of liked the idea. So we took a non flyable B 52, they mounted spoilers on the tops of the wings so it couldn't inadvertently try and fly, and we engaged this net system at 180 knots. Um, and amazingly, it worked really good. The only damage to the airplane was dimples and dents in the front edges of the wings, but it stopped the airplane. Uh, we actually filled the fuel tanks with this uh, B 52. Make it heavier, not so they have this in airplane. So there's definitely an egg operation making it the next uh Grand Jet World War One Navy. The problem is Grand Jet was the same as World War II submarine sailor. All the big airplanes. I have an uncle who was an Air Force guy. 747 L2. So Navy in the 60s. Way too big. As a kid, you would not even think about going to the Navy. Click the Coast Guard you couldn't get into them or gravity you couldn't get into them. I don't know if it ever went anywhere. I've never heard. I I don't know, but, uh, but that was the end of our testing because everybody said, well, what are we going to do now with these big airplanes? We also provided support for the Air Force Flight Test Pilot, or test pilot School. Test Pilot School was pretty amazing. They were uh, always guys who were in their second enlistment. They were picked from the Air Force for their piloting skills. And it was a pretty intensive training for, uh, for test pilots. And they had several airplanes. They used the T-33s for spin recovery testing. I always thought it was a little weird. Um, my boss was a really nice guy, cool guy, and I was the only GI in the, in the control center. So he said to me one day, you know, if you're going to be controlling these missions, you ought to go fly them so you know what you're doing. Um, all the old guys that I was working with, they didn't want to fly it. So, uh, and we had requirement from time to time for somebody to fly in the chaser range. So off I went and uh, did some spins in the T-33. The first guy that I was flying was, well, I don't want to use this airplane because I can just let go of everything and it'll pretty much recover itself. Uh, it's not that hard to recover a T-33 from a spin. They had a bunch of them. They had T-38s that they used for several different other uh, training and test flights. We also used the T-38 for a chase airplane quite a bit. Uh, from a guy sitting in the back seat, the T-38 was my favorite in the back seat because the, the view in the back of the T-38 was spectacular. Big, big canopy and, and 
really see good from the back seat. The outside has all fours.
discovery or corona, except we couldn't say corona, so we called it discovery. We couldn't use the word corona. If you say corona anywhere around Ron Pincher, he still goes into a stroke <laughs> mode. Um, and we were testing parachutes. Chuck was over in Hawaii doing the actual work. We were testing parachutes, we were testing grappling hooks. They were kind of grappling hooks in this program. So here's the just a quick picture of the uh, corona or discovery satellite, whatever you want to call it. And two film canisters. Here's a picture of one of the canisters. Here's one of the calibration targets. These are sort of interesting. You can still find these in some places. They poured these concrete calibration targets, usually out in the desert. Uh, they were surveyed in, they knew exactly what size they were. So you can take a picture of this, and then from this, you can calibrate the data that you took of what you were really trying to take a picture of. Then they came up with the Hexagon satellite, they decided the corona wasn't big enough because it had four so, uh, Much, much larger satellite. Uh, but we caught a lot of, a lot of stuff. We throw it out, go up to 25,000 feet, throw it out the back of one airplane, they go down and snatch it up with another. But here's the, uh, the hexagon. Here's one of the C-130s picking up one of the, the uh, film packs. Use the system to run out the back of the airplane and grab them out of the sky. And again, Chuck was out with Hawaii doing this for real. Here's a 15,000 pound uh, film pack satellite or whatever it was supposed to be. Um, this one was different than it had that dome on the top of the gauge, that dome with the hooks instead of the main parachute. Um, and it was supposedly stronger, had bigger straps, and it was stronger when we grabbed it and it wouldn't tear through. Plus somebody had the vision that if it did tear through that the main chute would reopen and the package might safely uh, soft land in the ocean and maybe they could find it. We were still doing work with the U-2. This is one of my favorite pictures of this particular individual. This is Kelly Johnson standing here next to this U2. But does anybody see anything that looks odd with this U2? Look at the tip. Look at the tail numbers. Yeah, that's what I think. Civilian tail numbers. This was not an Air Force airplane. This is a CIA airplane. And had had uh, civilian tail numbers, which I always thought was pretty funny. The, uh, the Air Force U-2s had red tail numbers that were about this big. And we had the good old SR-71 and YF-12s. Um, still doing testing on those at that time. This is the only decent picture you can find of one on the ground. And um, it's always odd to me to see these because our airplane did not have all these white markings. The airplanes just had red tail numbers, little small red tail numbers. And, didn't have the skunk on the tail or any of this other stuff. But we we're still testing YF-12. We still hadn't given up the idea of making the SR-71 a fighter airplane. Um, so let's see if this let's see if this will work. This is the Fire burned through the hydraulic lines and I lost my hydraulic. Yeah, 
city Jackson sequence. We have an actual rocket motors underneath the seats to propel us out of the airplane. Takeoffs. 
There was a file profile and the uh, FAA observer. The uh, touchdown powered up to, to take off and the, the engine on the wing that had the uh, no power engine flamed out. And the airplane just did a, 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 a pirouette or whatever, and a somersault and crashed straight dead on the nose. Um, of course, killing all three of the, of the crew. Terrible crash. We had great pictures of it. We had videotaped the crash because one of our radars had, had broken down and the radar guys had just fixed it. They called me and they said, can we uh, try the radar? And I said, sure. And then I had been working on a video recorder. I said, good, that's good. I need to check the, the uh, video recorder too. Let's find a target down on the flight line somewhere. Well, these guys were flying around. Could you find a better radar target than this big giant silver thing? So we actually had videotape of the crash, which the FAA was amazed that we did. It was sheer blind luck that we did because under normal circumstances there wouldn't have been any, any pictures. We also supported NASA. NASA had their own radars, they had their own control center, but we were always the backup for NASA. This is the NASA hangar. Um, and they were flying all kinds of crazy stuff. They were like a flying brick. The uh, glide ratio was non-existent. And uh, <laughs> so here's the uh, M2, F2, which was one of the earlier ones. You've seen pictures of this one flying, probably, because if you watch the $6 million man, this is the airplane that crashes in the beginning of the $6 million man. Uh, and the, those pictures, again, were taken by one of the tracking radars. Uh, it's a big lens on a landing. The crash was caused because uh, he was uh, he was worried about a photography helicopter that was uh, in the area, and he thought the guy was in the way. And they kept, the controller kept telling him he wasn't in the way, but he got worried about it and didn't get the landing gear out in time. Um, because on this thing, as soon as the gear came out there, what little lift there was was totally gone, and he landed gear up. And you know how if you slide something across the table and slide like this, but as soon as it hit some little irregularity, it'll, it'll kind of turn sideways. Well, that's what happened to this one. And that's what it looked like when it was done. So NASA decided, well, we can't waste this good airplane. So they rebuilt it. And it now became the M2F3. People look at this and go, there's no way that crashed up airplane flew again. Well, it did. It's right there. And they added a third fin because that was one of the problems that the pilot complained about was, uh, was uh, yaw stability, just the two tail fins. So they added a third fin. Then there was the X-24A, which was a real goofy looking thing. Then there was the X-24B, how they named all these, I don't know, somebody decided it was a cool way to name them. But all three of these were dead dropped off the of B-52, uh, they had a rocket motor in it to get more altitude, and then they would dead stick land on the lake. Here's the uh, HL-10, and the, you can see, I probably can't read the numbers, but this thing was not big. It was a little tiny airplane. And it's almost bad to call it an airplane because it almost was. Uh, I worked on the last flight of the X-15. They were just wrapping up X-15 when I was there. And uh, amazing, amazing airplane. Uh, most people still don't have any idea of the things that the X-15 did and the records and, uh, and, and how old it was. This was not something that happened in 1990. And then they put extra tanks on it, trying to get more uh, altitude so they carry more fuel. So the record was 353,000 feet on the X-15 at 4520 miles per hour. That's hypersonic, right? Uh, they put this ablative coating on it, thinking that would help it go faster and higher. Um, but the last day that the blue X-15 was uh, kind of sad. Everybody was sorry to see it go, and they. Flew it, landed it, and then two days later was loaded up on the B-52 and taken to the Smithsonian. B-70 worked on the last flight of this airplane as well. They built two B-70s, uh, one of which crashed in a highly publicized uh, photography adventure. Like 
blackbirds were. They hadn't figured that out yet. Um, every time they flew, they had to repaint it with paint off of uh, a lot of surfaces. Unfortunately, the B-70 crashed uh, while on a photo op from General Electric. They were, had a bunch of GE engine airplanes around it. And it, uh, the Model 4 got in too close. And for those of you that are flown airplanes close to other airplanes, you know that you never want to approach another airplane from above the wing. If you're going to approach the other airplane in close, you want to approach them down below where the air is relatively smooth. This thing kind of faked you out because with the wingtips tipped down, that bad air was this way also, not just up. And the 104 got in that wingtip air and rolled across the tails and took two tails off. That was uh, Walker. He was in the uh, existing B-70s in the museum uh, of the Air Force in the eight minutes. One of the only ones left. Space shuttle with studies. We launched these balloons every day for the four years, or three and a half years I was there. Every day we launched this balloon. It's full of hydrogen, which the weather balloon guys really hated um, because it wasn't helium. We tracked it to 65,000 feet. We tracked the wind speed, wind direction every single day. We were supposed to be developing wind patterns for the space shuttle. And you know what we discovered? There was no pattern. <laughs> every day was different, every month was different, but one May was different from the other May. I don't know where these things came down. They had a valve in them and they would expel gas because they were, they were uh, launched full, tight. And they had uh, aluminum shavings in there, so they were great radar. <coughs> And it would go to about 65,000 and it would just go, go, go. Pretty soon it just disappeared. We couldn't track it anymore. I don't know where they ended up. I always thought there was probably some farmer in Kansas somewhere. And he seemed to be landing at his farm and he was figured he was being invaded by aliens or something. So of course there was no, there was no markings on it saying return to NASA or any other nifty thing. The big airplanes caused another issue, which was weight turbulence. Um, again, nobody had any idea. I mean, they did, but they didn't have any idea what the weight turbulence was going to be like off these big airplanes from C-5 down to, to the big air, uh, airliners. So we set up our radar and we vectored in every kind of airplane you could imagine from Cessna 150s to airliners to everything you could imagine. Different offsets, back, side to side, up and down. According the data to see how far back these airplanes were affected by the wind turbulence. Um, one of the worst ones I saw early on was the C-5. This guy in F-4 came in and 14 miles back hit the wind turbulence off the C-5, rolled over and fell through the 